In today's episode, Daniel and I offer some possible solutions for a listener struggling to afford the high cost of exterior painting. And later, we'll chat with Kari Ann Wood, a longtime blogger with a special connection to her old house. But first, I'm Stacy Grinsfelder. And I'm Daniel Cantor. You're listening to True Tales from Old Houses. Well, hello, Daniel. Hello. Happy June. How's it going? Good. June already. I know. Can't believe it. This is unacceptable. Yes. (laughs) I had so many plans, aspirations, things that I thought I would have done by June. And yeah, it really hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I don't even know if summer has officially started and I'm already very behind on my summer projects. So that's how it's going over at the ranch here. Fortunately, it is not the official start of summer. That comes in a couple of weeks. And so we have until then to pretend that we are going to be amazing at everything we choose to do this summer. There you go. I like your energy. It was those lies and drama we (laughs) talked about. Exactly. Our words of 2024. And speaking of, before we launch into today's episode, (laughs) do I do it? Can I do it? I love to steal your parts. You can steal my parts, but you may not introduce it in that way. As a segue from Lies and Drama. Exactly. Okay, unrelated to Lies and Drama, we would love to thank our sponsors for today's episode and season 11 overall. They include The Window Course by Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog, our friends at Sutherland Wells, our friends at Abitron, and Noonan Heritage Craftworks. We are so grateful to all of you. Our sponsors, they keep the lights on around here and they are wonderful human beings who run exceptional businesses. So please shop with them. Their products and services are right up your alley. Absolutely. Handpicked for you. You got any announcements? I do have announcements. The first one is another thank you. Those five-star ratings and reviews, they're rolling in from Apple Podcasts. Are they? They are. They are. guys. And it's, of course... So lovely to read them, but they also do help people find the show. They tell people that the show is worth a listen. So we are really grateful for that. If you are a Spotify listener, I have another little nudge for you. They have their own set of rules outside of Apple Podcasts. They're doing their own thing. I respect that. To that end, they do collect their own ratings and reviews. So if you listen to the show on Spotify, that platform specifically, if you could Do a few ratings and reviews. That would be fantastic. Cool. I use Spotify. I did not know that it was separate. And outside of ratings and reviews, if that's not your thing or you want to do something a little extra, we would love it if you shared the show on social media. You can just take a quick screenshot, send it to your followers, and hopefully we will reach a bunch of new people on social media this season. Absolutely. What's next? Well, you tell me. I can say we're still looking for listener questions for this season. So over the past 10 seasons, Stacy mostly, but I started a couple seasons ago. We've covered a ton of topics, but it is such a fun part of doing this podcast because we don't know what's going to come our way. And I feel like I often learn things in the course of answering these questions. So keep them coming. You can leave them on our contact form on the website or through voicemail. Right. And speaking of voicemail, whenever you have any thoughts or comments about the episodes, doesn't necessarily have to be a question please feel free to leave your feedback using that mic icon. We love to hear from you. And it would be really fun to share your voicemails with the True Tales from Old Houses community. Absolutely. And one final announcement. We still have space in the window restoration workshops that I'm teaching this summer. And I just want to make sure that everyone heard that Brad and I, so excited, we were able to significantly reduce the ticket price for those upcoming window workshops at Silver Lake due to some new sponsors. So the new, even better ticket price is $3.99 for a single, or you can grab a buddy and pay the duo price of $6.99. So what does that reduce down to? That is less than $3.50 a ticket. Right under the wire. (laughs) Check my math, yes. For that new price, you're going to get over 16 hours of instruction, including lead safe education from certified instructor. That's me. Brad certified as well. You'll get breakfast and lunch on Saturday and Sunday, plus snacks. There are also some after hours excursions. You can go to Letchworth State Park or Wildflower Farm and Micro Creamery. There'll be a swag bag with a work apron, local treats, and my favorite glass cutter. You'll also get two 15-minute follow-up calls if you need them. If you get stuck at home, you can call me and we'll, we'll figure it out together. 
There's a money-back guarantee. If you do not learn what you need to rehab your windows at home, I personally will refund your money. Aside from all of that wonderful value, this is also a really cool old community. It's a Methodist camp from the 1870s. We're working on a building that is part of a much larger restoration project, but the building itself is sort of the central community hub of this entire place for the last 150 years or so. So really, really cool building, cool project to contribute to. In many years, you can drive by and say, I I restored that window sash and it's a nice time. And it's a cool area to explore. Lots of good antiquing and thrifting for your off hours and a nice community. It's cool. Come for a weekend, stay for a vacation. That's what I always say. (laughs) Leave your heart in Wyoming County, New York. (laughs) <laughs> that's what I always say. <laughs> wow, that needs to be on a t-shirt or a hat. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Our ultimate goal is to extend window restoration education. So we want you to take these skills that you learn, take them back to your community. And if we can save world windows, we will diminish our environmental footprint. We can offer homeowner savings and ensure, of course, a future for more old windows. As far as I'm concerned, as far as Daniel's concerned, I'm putting words in your mouth. You've got nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. I think I said this before, but I think the cost of the window workshop would not even pay for the professional restoration of one window in most places. So it's a good value because it's also fun and you'll make friends and uh, there's that. (laughs) Right. So to learn more and reserve your spot, visit BlakeHillHouse.com. I like announcements. I have not said it this year, but I'll say it again. If you are a nonprofit or you have something coming up that you would like this audience to hear about, then you're always welcome to drop me a line. And if the timing works, then I'll give it a little shout out in that announcement section. Yeah, we love to celebrate cool projects, small victories. Tell us things to announce. I'll get my bugle ready. (laughs) Your bugle. (laughs) The town crier now. (laughs) (laughs) How would it go over if we just like did announcements like that? Announcement one, hear ye, hear ye. Just so loud. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Blast out everyone's headphones. There is a window workshop at Silver Lake Institute this July. So yeah, I don't know. How would your town crier voice sound? Obnoxious. That's how it would sound. All the dogs would come running and people would slam their windows shut. Uh, (laughs) What have you been up to? Tell me the home report. What's going on? You wanted to say, tell me everything, but instead you're like, we don't have only have 30 (laughs) seconds to do so. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to keep it really short, keep most of my updates to the mini-sode next week. But mainly what I'm doing is prepping for the window restoration workshop at Silver Lake. So we've pulled some windows. We've put some of the other windows back. I'm ordering supplies, getting all those goodies for the swag bag. So that's where my focus is right now is windows. I just recently finished up a pretty big property cleanup project. This year at my house, this was the first year that I actually kind of quantified it. I thought, how long does it really take to bring this place back after winter? And so far, I'm up to about 30 hours. Uh Uh-huh. Sounds bad, right? I guess I never really thought about that before. So that 30 hours included basically weeding, mowing, pruning, tree pruning, I should say, trimming. We always have some tree issues Mm -hmm. after the winter. But yeah, glad to have that behind me. And it looks pretty sharp around here. Nice. I've been kind of doing the same thing and also kind of quantifying in a way I normally don't. That's so weird. So yeah, I, a couple of weeks ago, I w- I've been so like head down on that cottage for a while. But I have my own life as well and my own home that's falling apart around me. So I uh, decided I was going to for a few weeks do like a night shift of one hour when I get back, at least an hour in the yard. That hour every time has turned into like three or four hours. So I've I've worked a few shifts. It's starting to get better. But I'm sort of at a point with my yard too where things that I did are now needing to be redone, refreshed, etc. So I just ordered six hundred dollars worth of two by fours for my planters because uh, it's been like 10 years. They're kind of rotting. I just gotta deal with it. I don't want to plant all my little starters for the three tomatoes I get every year (laughs) before I (laughs) fix the bat. You know, it's also worth it. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. It just does a lot for your heart and your health to (laughs) get those harvest those three tomatoes that you planted. Yeah. Well, we'll catch up more on next week's menu if that's all right with you. Okay. Much to discuss. All right. And we, right now, we are going to take a break because listener Q&A is up next.
True Tales from Old Houses is supported by The Window Course. The Window Course, created by Scott Seidler of The Craftsman Blog, is a step-by-step do-it-yourself program that will teach you everything you need to know to successfully restore your wood windows. It's self-paced, so you can go as slow or as fast as you need, and there are also several price points to fit your needs and budget. Now that we're headed into the warmer months, it is officially window season. So now is the perfect time to get ready to restore the windows at your house. And the window course has all the information that you need all in one place. Scott is offering his students a special deal. If you sign up for the lifetime access package or training package, then you'll also get a free infrared paint remover, which is a $100 value. The window course comes with a money-back guarantee, and Scott is offering True Tales from Old Houses listeners a special discount. For 10% off, visit thewindowcourse.com and use the coupon code TRUETALES. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Sutherland Wells. All of Sutherland Wells' products are handcrafted in Providence, Rhode Island, with the highest quality, sustainably grown tongue oil. Tongue oil, which is native to China, has been used for centuries as a durable finish for wood, metal, and stone. Said it before, I'll say it again, unlike polyurethane, tongue oil finish actually penetrates the surface of the wood, so it flexes and contracts as the conditions change, which makes it the perfect pre-finish or protectant for everything from fine furniture to window sash and sills. You know, I'm a huge fan of the Clarabelle's Plus oil primer combination for window work. I also like the Slicky Wicky, Millie's, Murdoch's. I've tried so many of them. And whatever project you personally are working on, Sutherland Wells has an entire product line. This season, you might be working on siding, hardwood floors, furniture restoration, cutting boards, you name it. So to learn more about the complete product line, visit Sutherland Wells. That's W-E-L-L-E-S, SutherlandWells.com. And to save 10% on your first order, use the coupon code TRUETALES. I have a question for you, Daniel. Uh Uh-oh. Okay. Do you like exterior painting? Honest answers only. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. I don't either. But why do you ask, Stacey? Well, because this week's question comes from Marika. And Marika owns a duplex with her friends in what I think must be Portland, Oregon, based on her Instagram handle, which is Swift period house period PDX. That's Portland, right? I recognize that username. Hi, Marika. Yes, PDX, Portland. Okay, so she lives in one half of the duplex and her besties in the other, which I think is a pretty great setup. Oh, it's like a sitcom. How cute. I believe this is a fairly recent purchase, and they have addressed a number of issues with the envelope, including they've done some foundation work, some sagging issues. So they have already worked a little bit on the exterior and done a ton of stuff on the interior. But according to Marika, the exterior is still in very rough shape, and it needs to be painted as soon as possible. She collected two quotes. Want to guess how much they were? How big is this house? Well, she said it's big. She describes it as a big old duplex. I'm going to say big old duplex. Okay, I'm going to throw out a really big number to be safe. 30,000. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? The two bids she collected were $67,000 and $78,000 to paint the whole thing. Chills ran down my back. (laughs) Like, I'm not even kidding. Yeah. That's horrifying. That's almost as much as I paid for my house. Okay. (laughs) Right, right. Now, all right, that's a lot of money. And Marika and her co-owners, they do not have that money right now. They also do not qualify for a HELOC at this time, a home equity line of credit. Now, I know the cost of living is different in different parts of the country. So I'm thinking about that money and I'm thinking about the fact that it's Portland. And I'm guessing, hoping that that price is high in part because it includes lead safety disposal and reporting. That might be part of why the bill is a little higher. Now, you and I both know what happens happens with paint companies, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Don't ask too many questions. Let's not get crazy. There's what we think is happening. There's what they tell us is happening. And then there's what is really happening. I'm not saying that paint companies are shifty. I'm just saying when it comes to old houses, there are some things to consider when it comes to painting. The price of paint has also increased, so naturally the cost of painting a house is going to increase. Anyway, Marika and her friends are committed to having the house painted, which is their wonderful stewards, it sounds like. But they're looking for some interim solutions while they save the money to pay the pros. So her questions are, let's see, one, two, three, 
four. They're fourfold. Oh, I'm going to tell okay. you the questions and then we'll just sort of break it down. But her questions are, she says, do you have advice on how we might be able to DIY this enough to get the paint to last a few more years while we save? She also asked, should we scrape or just paint over it? Third part of the question is, do you have recommendations for an inexpensive paint sprayer or 30-foot ladder? And the final part of the question is, is there a good tutorial like Daniel's interior paint tutorial? A lot of questions within a question. I have one of those. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you do. You probably wrote it in 2012, right? I should really look at my own blog every now and then. Okay, we can do this. So let's break that down just a little and talk about the first one. So do you have any advice on how we might be able to DIY this enough to paint to last a few more years? Now, I'm going to throw something out there right away. This is not a DIY solution, but this is what we did for our house which we also had fully painted by professionals. And when I total up the price of having that done, it's pretty darn close, Marika, to what you were quoted. So we did ours in stages. The first year, I had all the trim around the roof painted because that had been pretty well destroyed when we got our new roof. And then the next year, I had the front and one side painted. And then the third year, I had the other side and the back painted. And how I chose to do that was I, you know, I didn't want it to look completely insane, <laughs> partially painted. But then again, life is what it is. This is how we do things sometimes. So I picked the front, what people would see mostly, and then I picked the most exposed side. So I actually had kind of a joke with my neighbors that, you know, one of them had premium view, the painted side, and then the other side, other neighbors had you know, regular view. And that's how we got through it. That's how we paid for it. We we did it in three years time, paying for it in stages, and that worked really well. So that is not exactly what you asked for as far as a DIY solution, but that's what I've got for you. So consider that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that advice to potentially do it in stages definitely holds for DIY as well. So I've kind of tackled my house one side at a time which is both removing the vinyl and then dealing with the wood siding in whatever form that takes underneath. So yeah, just keeping it kind of approachable by doing one wall at a time instead of trying to tackle this whole house and its many, many walls with its various additions and things. There's a lot of walls. So I think that's really good advice. I guess on a practical level, as a homeowner, you are allowed to do your own lead paint Work. So in terms of scraping and stuff. The EPA does have a really nice PDF for DIYers about lead safety. And I'm going to drop that in the show notes. That's super helpful for anybody who's doing some painting. Zach Academy, they offer vocational training, which is the lead safety training. That's the training that you took, Daniel, and that I mm -hmm. took as well. And Brad, that runs around $300. You know, if you're talking about a DIY solution and maybe you want it to be your actual solution, not just an interim one, then it might be good to go and take that training. And the reason why I say that is because I believe, actually, I know that in Portland, <laughs> you are more likely to have your actions reported to the city. <laughs> and that feels true. Yeah, when it comes to painting and removing lead paint. So I think it's a great idea. You know, we all have to make our own decisions, but I, I think it's a great idea to get that lead safety training and do what you can to follow those guidelines on the exterior. Mm -hmm. That's just me, though. Go ahead. If you do choose to hire the work or parts of the work, you know, hiring them for one elevation isn't necessarily a bad idea if only just to see the quality of the work. But this is one of those jobs that it's obviously very expensive. It's not something you want to redo more than you have to. So this is one where really, truly try to find references, examples of past work. I don't want to see a paint job that was done a year ago. I want to see a paint job that was done five to 10 years ago. There's a lot of range of quality, especially if you have any kind of like rot or anything that's going to need to be repaired in conjunction with the paint job. Just, you know, make sure that if you are paying for this work, it's good work. I agree. Sure, absolutely. I already forgot the other parts of the question. <laughs> well, we kind of answered that in twofold. We got into the, the first two parts of the question. So we talked about DIY interim solutions. She also asked, should they try to scrape it or just paint over it? So do you have any thoughts about that? Yes, I would say I never really get concerned with things being brought back to bare wood. Certainly you could do that, but it would be an enormous effort. 
basically, I think, generally scrape what's flaking off already. No sense in painting over stuff that's not adhered. Along with that, a product that I really have found a lot of success with for exterior, and it's pretty much made for this, is Zenser's Triple Thick Peel Stop Primer. As far as I can tell, it's basically glue. And so if you have any areas where you've kind of scraped as much as is scraping, but you're concerned that it might continue to peel, you know, which does happen, this is a really good primer for just kind of like almost gluing the paint back to the surface of the wood. It's held up really well for me. It's easy to use. It's, you know, it's a can of primer. All right. So the third part of this question is, do you have recommendations for an inexpensive paint sprayer or 30-foot ladder? And again, I'm going to stray from the question because I personally love renting a boom lift for this type of work if you're going to go high up on the second. I know that it's expensive. And I guess what I'm doing and when I consider expenses is I consider the expense of this professional painter or, you know, my own time, which Mm -hmm. is worth money. And I think renting the boom lift will keep you nice and safe. It's very fast. You don't have to be scooting a ladder over anywhere. And a 30-foot ladder is heavy as heck. I can tell you that right now. It's going to take you and all your neighbors to move that thing Mm -hmm. around, even if they're big, strong people and you are a crossfitter who likes to lift ladders for fun. It's a lot of work. It's heavy. It's so hard to balance, too. So it's, yes. even if it's not the weight, it's like once it starts to list and then it's like falling and then oh, you have so a 30 foot ladder in the road. Not that I've ever had that happen. No, not at all. <laughs> I think the boom lift is a really good uh, suggestion for sure. If you're in a narrow spot, you can use the scissor lift, which goes mm-hmm. in between buildings more. So if you're in, in, in a city, sometimes the houses are too close for something like a boom lift. But yeah, mm-hmm. anyway, go ahead. Boom lift is not always practical or scissor lift, depending on how your house is oriented and where it's located. So for instance, I don't think I could ever have a boom lift here unless it was in my driveway, which would not help at all for the front of the house or anything because I'm on a busy road. There's no parking on the side of the street. Like it won't happen. Another option is, and I'm a little speaking out of turn because I don't totally know how this works because I've never done it, but I'm pretty sure you can hire a company to come in and put up scaffolds and you basically rent the scaffold for a certain length of time and then they come take it down when you're done. And so I think I'm probably going to end up doing that for my house. It's going to be a little crazy, but I think that's kind of my only choice, you know, especially when you're doing a lot of prep and stuff, doing that from a ladder and having to move that ladder constantly, it's going to be a nightmare. So staying safe is really important. That's why we don't really recommend a ladder at all, honestly. And then the next part is the paint sprayer. I have a really low end. I think it's a Graco sprayer. It's fine, but it is not. It's never worked properly with a five gallon bucket. Okay. So I'm not going there. But you have the kind that, you know, you stick the hose in the bucket. You're not filling a chamber. Okay. That's interesting. It works both ways. It has both a chamber and it has the tube, but I've never gotten the tube to work properly. Interesting. Okay. So I have, because she asked for inexpensive, I actually have two professional paint sprayers. They are both great go. The smaller one is the Magnum X5. And then I honestly can't remember what the bigger one is, but they work pretty much exactly the same. And the X5 was quite a bit cheaper. Essentially two types of paint sprayers. One will have like a little chamber that you fill with the paint and then spray. Those tend to be a lot more user-friendly, but for a job like this, forget it. You're going to be filling that thing constantly. It's not going to do what you want it to do. What you really need is something that's going to draw the paint directly out of the bucket of paint. You'll probably be using a five-gallon bucket because you're painting a house. I recommend that machine with the caveat that it's a little bit of a learning curve to like get it started. I generally have to watch a YouTube video every time just to remember specifically how to prime the machine. But once you get it going, it works great. Both of those are in about, what, the $200 to $300 range? Yeah, I would think so, yeah. Okay. And then I would also note generally with paint spraying, you still want to back brush over what you've sprayed. So it does significantly speed things along. I don't want to pretend it doesn't, but it's not like it cuts out all of your manual brush work. So to wrap this topic up, Marika also asked, is there a good tutorial? And I found one for you, one that I'd read before that I really loved, and it comes from the My Old House Fix website. And I'm going to put that in the show notes. It's called Nine Critical Steps to Ensure a Long-Lasting Paint Job, 
And it is based on a lot of excellent advice from OG painters in the preservation world. I recognized some of the information. It's written by Christopher Hewitt. He's been a guest on the show before. Yeah, he knows. He knows the stuff. The article itself is very comprehensive and it has excellent information. So I'm going to, I think I said link that in the show notes. If not, I'm going to tell you again, it's going to be right in the show notes. So anyone who is looking for exterior painting advice will find it there. Very cool. I think we covered it. I think we did a good job. I get final thing I would say is there is an element of you get what you pay for with materials on this one too. So do not cheap out on your caulks and sealants specifically. Those are the things that will protect your paint job for a long time and prevent water intrusion. So don't do the $2 tube. It will make you cry in about two months. All right. Well, thank you for that question, Marika. Please let us know what you decide. Now I need some follow-up on this one. And if anyone else has a question for us to answer on an upcoming episode, go to truetalesfromoldhouses.com and click on that contact link to submit your question. You can also leave your question via voicemail, which I think we mentioned earlier. There's a mic icon on the bottom right corner of the website. So you just click on that. It'll give you some prompts and we will look forward to hearing your gorgeous voice. Now that we've answered that, it is time for another quick break. Our chat with Karian Wood is coming up next. True Tales from Old Houses is supported by Abitron. Stacy, you and I, we love our old houses, our big old wood houses, but we cannot talk about them without eventually acknowledging the challenge of rotted and damaged wood. Windows, doors, columns, balusters, any other wooden features will ultimately break down if exposed to the elements for long enough. And Abitron products can help. Now, for years, I have turned to Abitron's liquid wood and wood epox to make durable, cost-effective repairs on my own wooden doors and windows. The system, it contains two products, an epoxy wood hardener. That's the liquid wood. And a lightweight epoxy wood filler. That's the wood epox. And with those two products, the liquid wood and wood epox, you can effectively harden soft wood, you can patch pieces that are missing altogether, or both. Now, I came to Abitron after many, many years of experimenting with lesser wood fillers, let's say, and I experienced how quickly those repairs failed over time. I now have more work ahead of me to redo that stuff. I really, really love Abitron because there's no shrinking, there's no cracking, it sands and paints just like wood, and I have never had one of these repairs fail. I think they will outlive me. Visit Abitron.com for all of the product information and to order directly. And available exclusively to True Tales from Old Houses listeners, that's you, Abitron is offering a 10% discount if you use the coupon code TRUE2024. So enter TRUE2024 at abitron.com and save those existing wood features instead of replacing them. True Tales from Old Houses is also supported by Noonan Heritage Craftworks. You may know Joseph Parenti from Instagram for his work with historic exteriors in the Pittsburgh area. He's now extending his offerings to homeowners across the United States with Noonan Heritage Craftworks. Stacy, as you and I both know, finding the right help to restore and maintain your old house can be a huge challenge. Where do you even start? What materials and methods should you use? Who can you trust? Joseph is here to help you. So schedule a phone call, video conference, or email consultation with Joseph to talk through your exterior project and help you game plan. Whether you need to prepare a scope of work, a second set of eyes to help compare estimates, or even figure out the right questions to ask vendors, Joseph can provide unbiased guidance to help you steer clear of pitfalls and ensure success. So to learn how Noonan Heritage Craftworks can work with you, visit our special landing page at Noonan Craftworks. That's N-O-O-N-A-N, Noonan craftworks.com slash true tales. Our guest today is Karian Wood. Karian is the longtime writer of a successful home and lifestyle blog called Thistlewood Farms. After many years of city living, she and her husband returned to her hometown in Texas and settled into a very familiar old house. My name is Kari Ann Wood, and I am so excited to be here. I write a blog called Thistlewood Farms, and you can find me anywhere online, all Thistlewood everything. And I love DIY projects. I love making over rooms. I love old houses, and I love vintage finds. Welcome, Kari Ann. Welcome. We're so excited to have you here. 
You and I met at Workbench Con of all places in Atlanta. Was that in March? My goodness, the the spring is flying by. I think it, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was in March. And the moment I met you, I thought she is so lovely and she tells an amazing story and it would be so wonderful to have her on podcast. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Well, great. That makes three of us. The fact that you were also an OG decor blogger, I thought was a really neat coincidence too. So you've been writing Thistlewood Farms, the Thistlewood Farms blog for since what, 2012, 2010? No, actually I started it on December 9th of 2011. (laughs) 2011. Wow, that's great. Old school, old school. (laughs) Well, one of the stories that you told me, we went out to dinner and you said that you lived in an old house. So immediately my interest was piqued, but this is not just any old house. This is a house that's very special to you. So why don't you start there? So I actually live in the house that I grew up in and it is the most amazing of stories. So I grew up here my whole life. I got dressed for my wedding right in the bathroom, right across from us. I'm sitting in my dad's office, chatting with y'all from my dad's office. I had my first kiss with my husband right out here on this curb and so many amazing, incredible memories. And about, I'd say probably now it's been about 10 years, my dad passed away and the house was, it was too much for my mom. And so my mom sold the house and I was devastated because of course, so many memories and joy and happiness are all here within the walls of this home. And I went on a goodbye tour of the house. I said, goodbye, dining room. Like it was nice chatting with you at Thanksgiving and goodbye living room and goodbye upstairs bedroom. And then I left the home and about five years later, we were living in Kentucky at the time, about five years later, we thought we're going to move back to Texas. And I wondered if the people that owned the home would sell it back. It wasn't on the market. And so I randomly... <laughs> Out of the blue, just called him up and I said, hey, like, what's up? Like, I used to live in your house. Would you sell it to me? And in amazing, incredible news, she said yes. And so it wasn't on the market. There was nothing at all. I mean, she just said it was very fortuitous timing. They were going to move. And so we ended up moving. We bought it back. And now I live, I'm living my dream. I live in all the rooms that I used to live in growing up. Wow. Wow. What a story. I was doing a little research for this episode too. And I thought, oh, Daniel and I recently had talked about sort of our childhood upbringings and things like that. I just found out that one of my childhood homes, and and don't feel sad yet, but it was actually just torn down. (laughs) It was raised. Oh, Oh, yes. Somebody sent me a picture and they're like, so it's gone. I was like, oh my goodness, it is is gone. It was just a little house. But I just was thinking about how much you wanted to live in yours. Nobody could pay me to go back to that house. So we're fine. (laughs) But... Truth is, of course, your house holds very special memories for you. So it must be wonderful being back there. Do you have sibling? I do. I'm the oldest of five. And of course, the best, you know, yeah, five. Of course. So, well, I'm the youngest. So I have a soft spot <laughs> for youngest. <laughs> so, yes, we all grew up here and we've had so many family memories. We've had Thanksgiving back here, just so many different events. We actually just recently celebrated my nieces. I had my 16th birthday party in this house and My kids celebrated their 16th birthday party in this house. And now we just celebrated my niece's 16th birthday party in the house. So yeah. And actually, most of my family still lives in the same town that we grew up in. What did your siblings say when you told them you were rebuying the house or buying the house, I guess, going back to live in it? I think they were all really excited. My mom's reaction actually was the most interesting because this is so shameful what I'm about to say. But when I was growing up here, my mom, in my opinion made a very unfortunate design decision in that she put a wall up that divided this. The kitchen's pretty massive. And she divided the kitchen and put a butler's pantry on one side of the kitchen, which to me made the kitchen smaller. We all know big kitchens are kind of a thing. And I remember being in high school and saying, mom, this is not the situation. Like, or maybe I was in college, (laughs) but anyway, regardless, I say, mom, this is not the situation. Because of course, you know, when you're young, you know everything. (laughs) Oh, sure. So (laughs) the day that we buy the house back, I call my mom and I say, hey, mom, I'm standing in the kitchen. You know, we have the keys. The house is back in the family. And my mom is like crying. She's like, this is so beautiful and wonderful. And I go, oh, well, you're about to cry. Hold on. (laughs) And I take a sledgehammer and I hit the cabinets of that wall. I said, this wall is coming down. (laughs) So we proceeded to take that wall down and we remodeled the entire house actually, but that was where it all started. She said, you're getting rid of my butler's pantry. I'm like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. (laughs) 
because I know you to be a nice person, I'm sure that you all had a good laugh about that afterwards, probably. Yeah, it might have taken a little bit of time, but... <laughs> Eventually. Eventually, there was laughter. Now she knows I was right. Now she knows for sure. So, so during the time that the family didn't own the house, had the owners made any changes or was it kind of walking back into what you left? They had made changes, a few changes, and they were lovely people, like so kind. And the choices they made, I actually liked them and kept several of the design decisions that they had made. Just for example, one thing they did was upstairs in the upstairs bedroom, they ripped off all of the old wallpaper, actually in the bedroom that I grew up in, they ripped off all the wallpaper and they exposed the original shiplap, which is like next level amazing. And they made several really great choices like that. And of course, I am eternally grateful to them for just letting us buy the house back. You know, they're such a lovely, lovely couple. That's so wild. And for doing the chore of removing all that wallpaper. Yes, I was like, (laughs) thank you. you." (laughs) (laughs) What style is the house and when was it built? The house was built in 1908 and it is a true four square. So they say I have all of the original like plans Everyone who's kind of owned the house, it's been in a lot of, well, just a few families actually, but for a long time. And so they kept, and originally the house was just, of course, four rooms on the bottom, four rooms on the top, but it's been expanded on since then. Mm -hmm. And it used to be the original postmaster's house for the town that I live in, McKinney, Texas. And so it's been on the local home tour a couple of times. And in interesting news, people, two sets of families that used to own the home have come back for tours of the house and given me things that were in the house, which is really cool, you know? So for example, one of the families that used to own the house, they came back and they gave me a marble urn that was outside in the garden. And so now it's in the, I put it back in the garden Neat. with a little pedestal uh-huh. out there. They also gave me a, their dad was a pharmacist and my husband is a pharmacist. So they gave me a really cool mortar and pedestal that was actually an ashtray, but like, hey, I'm going with it, whatever, you know? <laughs> Herbs, cigarettes, whichever. We love a (laughs) multi-purpose. You got to be efficient with that cabinet space. Listen. (laughs) Exactly. And so I, it's blue and white. Luckily, I love blue and white. So it's in my front living room. Uh, It's not been used as an ashtray, but it's sitting in the bookcases. So yeah, a lot of, lot of love. And that's the amazing thing about the house is when you come into the house, you can just feel the years and years of people loving and treasuring and honoring this grand old lady, I think is a great way of thinking of. Do you ever hesitate to change things because nostalgia hits? Oh, oh, that is a great question. Well, I'm kind of a bold person, so I might have a tiny bit of hesitation, but I really wanted to make the house mine or my family our own. And so I definitely have made some bold choices For example, um, I'm looking at a fireplace in this office right now that I painted navy blue. And there also were some other, I think, kind of bold choices that I have made. But the amazing thing about living in the house that you grew up in is around every corner, there's a memory. I mean, it's so next level. So for example, I'm talking to y'all right now. And if I were to flip the camera down, I'm sitting at the desk that my dad is my dad's desk. And it's in the office in the same place. I used to sit right in that chair over there in my Dairy Queen uniform, (laughs) coming in, you know, blizzard, all covered in blizzard and listening to my dad's like wise words from this side of the desk. So certain things like that, I just can't bear to get rid of because they're so special. But I have definitely made some some changes to the home. Well, now that you said Dairy Queen, I must know, blizzards or dilly bars, which are your favorites? Oh, hello, Captain Obvious, like blizzards, please. (laughs) (laughs) Daniel, have you ever eaten at Dairy Queen? Have you had the... Dairy Queen specials? I have eaten at Dairy Queen a couple times. We don't have them, I don't think, around here. But my mom is from Minnesota, and it's a big deal in Minnesota. I'm like, I feel like I'm more aware of Dairy Queen than my experience with Dairy Queen justifies. Well, they're kind of a Texas like staple. Like, if you know, you know. Like, if you're raised in Texas and you lived in a small town, you know, like the Dairy Queen is the situation. And I am the best blizzard maker that you. (laughs) (laughs) Bold, bold statement. (laughs) Bold statement, right. I know, believe in yourself. I love it. The confidence. (laughs) We'll call this the tangent portion of our interview, right? (laughs) Yes, exactly. 
So you changed the kitchen. What other types of things have you changed in the house? Oh, gosh. Let's get our checklist out. We changed the bathrooms. We changed, of course, the kitchen. Um, We knocked down several walls. We updated the staircase. We, of course, kind of consolidated all the air conditioning units. We painted the exterior. We've added a new roof. We've completely redone all the landscaping. I think that's it. How long have you lived there now? Six years. Oh, six years. Wow. That's so much progress in six years. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I mean, when it's what you do for a living, like when you're a home decor blogger, you know, and actually I'm about to re completely redo the, so the, the heart of this house, the most beautiful, or what I consider to me, the most beautiful feature of this home is there's a large central staircase. And the thing I like about it is you kind of discover it. So you come into the living room, there's a large living room with the dining room, and there's vintage French doors that separate the dining room from the living room. And the molding, of course, let's go 15 inch moldings. I mean, like, oh, just yeah. so beautiful. Deli- 1908. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I see you 1908. So you walk back through a French door and kind of discover this staircase, which is truly the heart of the home with this incredible, beautiful molding. There's a little hidden room, of course, under the staircase, um, beautiful newel posts, like these banisters. And it's, you walk a flight of stairs and there's a great landing with a window seat that runs the extent of the landing where I used to sit and read Nancy Drew books, giant window that overlooks the backyard. And then you continue up. So the staircase is kind of like a U, I guess would be in it. Yeah. And so we're about to redo the staircase and we're mimicking the molding that's on the original part of the staircase downstairs, carrying it up the top of the staircase. Okay. So I know. I Well, I hope it is as cool. I hope it's as cool as it is in my brain. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I love that. Like, I think we learn in our, you know, old house academy that you peel off layers, but I think people are really afraid to add layers and particularly adding kind of like ornamentation and formality to these houses, I think is often a really nice thing that you can add to put your stamp on it. That's not going to get torn out in another 20 years when the style has changed or whatever, you know, it just, it goes. That sounds really nice. I support you. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm oh, saying. Good. Thank you. <laughs> and for example, the banister is so lovely and some people might've painted it, but I just couldn't. I just love that beautiful old wood. And it's like, I've run my hand along that banister my whole life. And so we've oiled it and refurbished it and done all that, but we didn't paint anything that, you know, paint any of the wood. Like we left the wood intact because it, now I did paint the brick in here, but it was a hideous color. It was not cute <laughs> at all. And it wasn't like beautiful old brick that I um, painted, but for the most no part- No judgment for me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. But most of the original features to the house, we have left those architectural features intact. So yeah, it is It is an honor. It's like, I, I just consider myself like the guardian of it to pass it to the next generation. Yeah. To piggyback, I guess, on Daniel's idea of adding ornamentation. I've been having the struggle in my own house. And obviously this interview is with you, not with me. But since I have you, the two of you here, I have a question for you both. The question is, you know, so my house was considered uh, built in high style as well. It was a summer house for someone and it had the typical living area. And then we had the servant's quarters, right? So to me, I feel like the servant's quarters, that is, yes, that's a period in time of history, but that is not, we're not going back there. That's not going to be the way we're living now. So I've been considering adding some more ornamentation to that area in the house, especially down the hall, to make it better match the rest of the house rather than seeming like, you know, the, I don't know, an afterthought. And so I don't know, I've been struggling, like, do I do it? Do I, you know, all of it could be removed. So there is the do no harm aspect, which wouldn't be a big deal. But I've been struggling with that because I have two of my boys, their bedrooms were back there. And I just felt like they were in no man's land. You know, it's like, here, the rest of us are in the pretty house and this is where you live. Well, and they were the servants. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She sent them away now internationally. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And they were middle children, so they can work that all out in therapy. (laughs) But (laughs) yeah. So, I mean, what's your, what are your thoughts on something like that? But I guess, what is your thought about bringing something up to reflect more of today and moving forward? I think personally, just myself, my own design choices, I don't really have an issue with it. I kind of like, I think, you know, when you visit older homes, some older homes have incredible architectural detail and some don't, you know, depending on really, I think whoever built it, the amount of disposable income they had at the time. 
So for example, I'll just give you the perfect example of this. We have really high baseboards throughout the home and I think they're maybe 10 inches tall. And in the room I'm in now, because it was really an add-on, the baseboards were short. And so we went through and mimicked the baseboards in the rest of the home. I think anytime you're mimicking something else that's in your home, it's and making things feel more, I don't know, congruous. Is that a right? <laughs> cohesive, maybe? It's cohesive, yeah. that's much better. Much better. Okay, much better, yeah, right? I know what you're saying. Because I always think in my mind, maybe that person probably would have made that design choice. But back in the day, nobody had money to put 12 inch moldings throughout their entire home. Like it just wasn't the situation. And so to me, I feel like I'm kind of honoring their original aesthetic, but carrying it through the rest of the home. Yeah. And that situation makes a lot of sense to me. I would do the exact same thing. In fact, I did in my kitchen, same thing. I had a 40s kitchen in a 1800s house. And when we changed that, we made the moldings better match what was already here. I guess what I would say is I like when houses maintain the hierarchy of like in my house, the whole first floor has the same moldings profiles, except for the kitchen, where they're also stunning and big and bulky, but they're not the same. And then you go upstairs and they get a little simpler. And then by the time you reach what is now the laundry room, which was probably like a sewing room or something, they're like much simpler, but they're still fancy. And so I think as long as you're sort of maintaining still some sense of there being like a reduction in intricacy as you reach those more modest rooms. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with with adding to them. Just don't make them fancier than like the ballroom, right. you know? Right, right. That may not be the place for the chandelier. I got it. Right. <laughs> That's my hot take. One of the things that we did here in this house is there was kind of a, I feel like over the years, there was like a mismatch of styles where people had come along and added like that decade's style. And I tried really hard to go take it back with a little bit of a modern twist sometimes. But for example, I'll just give you one example. In the kitchen, there is molding. And then above that, there was probably, I don't know, maybe two or three feet of skip troweling where someone had come up and done like plaster kind of almost. And my guess would be maybe in the 60s, 70s, somewhere in there. And so it did not match the rest of everything going on. And so I knocked that down and put up just plain drywall to be respectful to the time period because back in 1908, I don't feel like people would have put skip trout. It would not have been a situation. And it's so easy to clean in a kitchen, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gross. I'm just picturing all that. Yeah. Just wipe it right down. <laughs> all the grease and uh, lint and stuff from all, or uh, yeah, all over the house. Stuck to that. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I think you made the right choice. Yeah, I agree. It's gone now. I was wondering, like, I feel like so many of us have the same experience of sort of like doing work on our houses, finding these old, you know, solutions somebody came up with that are just not the way and sort of sending one up to the Lord. Of, How could you? And I don't know, like, is that an experience you've had? And I assume it's very different when like, dad did that, not, you know, some guy that I've never met. Exactly. You could not have summed it up any better because sometimes I feel like, you know, my parents, a lot of things they did, it was on a wing and a prayer around here. And so I remember, oh gosh, I remember my dad doing that. Like, for example, one of the upstairs bathrooms, there was kind of a, I don't know, a kind of a sink that was randomly. Okay. So follow this. There was no faucet or with shower head. It was a bathtub with no shower head. And I think somebody, maybe my dad had rigged up kind of this whole shower thing that was like PVC pipe that kind of came up. It was like really a handheld shower that came out of the faucet. But at the time, it seemed like a great solution. Like, right. let's go. Right. Yeah. We can shower. This is wonderful. You have five siblings. Everybody, the more showers, the better in your house. Yeah. And my dad, I think, I think back to that all the time because it actually makes me feel super close to my parents because, you know, they didn't have a lot of money and they were living in this house and they were just trying to make it work. And there was no respecter of like, hey, this house was built in 1908. Right. There was none of that. There was just, hey, we're just trying to live and just yeah. make it through with our five kids. Yeah. That was such a practical generation. Was that shower situation still there when you got the house back? <laughs> I love that. I love that. And I hope you've kept it to this day, right? Shockingly. <laughs> shockingly. 
That was the only thing, and to that point, not the shower, but that bathroom. It had, y'all know when I describe it, y'all are gonna be like, mm-hmm, I see you. It had aqua tiles on the floor. And then it had these butterfly tiles on the walls that were interspersed. They were maybe four by four tiles and they were interspersed with white. So you had white tiles. Every now and then a butterfly would pop up. And I have stared at those butterflies my whole life. I mean, I've put my Merle Norman makeup on. I've teased my hair to, you know, the skies. Merle Norman, I forgot about that. I know, right? And that was like this thick when you didn't need that kind of makeup. It was like this thick and you're putting it on in front of a fan because, right. oh, by the way, I forgot to mention when I was raised in this house, there was no air in the house in oh, Texas. Oh, yeah. And so you'd stand in front of a fan and I'd just think like, oh, I've just got to get this makeup on and I'd stare at those butterflies. And so when we remodeled that bathroom, I asked the tile guys, hey, is there any way, can y'all save some of these butterfly tiles? And they saved two of them for me. And I framed them. <laughs> oh, that's neat. Kind of as an homage, as an homage to all the makeup right. applying butterfly staring days, you know, so. Right. Now you remember every time you see them, I'm sure. That's right. That's right. Oh, wow. And is your mom still living? Oh, yes. Yes. She's okay. Over here all the time. Is she like better than it's ever been or, or does she question your choices? I think she just accepts it. She has strong opinions. I have strong opinions and I love my mom. Like I, I love her. And I think there's a lot of things she wishes that she could have done to the house, but, and she had big plans and big dreams, but she had five kids, you know, and it was just, and she was trying to put us all through college. And then I think right when they potentially could have done some stuff to the house, then my father passed away. And so I think she's happy and she sees that the house is so happy. So I think that makes her happy. And I love my mom and we have had the best conversations kind of cozied up in the living room where we used to talk when I was young, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of gold, but I think every now and then I'll do something and she's like, oh, I know one thing. Oh, I know one thing (laughs) that she was not about. So apparently this style of home, I'm not sure exactly, you know, you asked me what type I, I've heard people say it's a Georgian home. I'm not sure, but apparently historically Georgian, and I don't know this for a fact, so feel free to correct me in any way, but that Georgian homes on the exterior do not have shutters. When my parents bought the home, they took the shutters off. I, again, big opinion when I was, you know, 18 years old, that I thought it should have shutters. It's a very father of the bride looking home. It's a good way of explaining it. With like, you know, the house, the square house, the columns in the front, the big porch leading up. And so I always thought it needed jewelry. It needed some shutters. And not only did I want shutters, but I wanted, as if I live in Nantucket or something, I wanted those little um, shutter clasps that you put on to like, as if there was going to be a- Oh, shutter dogs. Yeah, that's, they're called yes, shutter dogs. Yes, that's, mm-hmm. yes, that's the term. And so when we had the house painted, I added shutters and shutter dogs. And the look on my mom's face when she came over here. She was not into it. Like we threw those away. <laughs> Daniel, does that ring a bell for you? Because I think shutters were more about no. function. I think they would have been there. They could have been there. Yeah, huh? and- I would not call your house the Georgian. Oh, no. good. Oh, good. Okay, good. Good. No. Good. What would you call it? Well, I call it an American Forest Square, which which is what I said at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and I I think that's maybe under the umbrella of Colonial Revival. Did I make that up? Yeah, because it would be distinctly American versus yeah, and like Father of the Bride House, that's a Colonial Revival house, like through and through. I would not. Yes, you've solved my problem. I had no. I mean, this is just things I hear from my mom growing up, and so. She just would always say things like that. And then I thought, no, I don't know. And if it had shutters in the 70s or whenever they threw them away, it's unlikely somebody would have added them between 1908. So they were probably original to the house. So Yeah. Well, I went back and looked at the original house, the pictures that I have from back before they, because they redone the porch and everything way before my parents. And it had shutters. Yeah, yeah, I think you're safe. Yeah, I think I, I think you made the right call. I think you can do this one of two ways. You can call your mother and say, I was right. Or <laughs> you can say nothing. But when you go to bed tonight, you can assure yourself that you made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll pick option. I think I'll pick option too. I would too. No, and I'm sure your mom's great. It sounds like you have a similar relationship with your mother that I have with mine. And so I could call her and say that to her and she would, she and I would get a good laugh. But yeah. Yes, for sure. Go to bed peacefully at night, knowing that shutters belong on your house. Just fine. (laughs) I actually have the coolest story about, so I'm a big yard sailor, thrifter, all of that stuff. And right after we bought the house, it was maybe like a year. 
I went to a yard sale that was maybe two blocks over. I found this really cool dresser. I have a story all about this on the blog, but I found this really cool dresser and I brought it home and I opened up the drawer and in, I kid you not, I could not make this up if I tried, in the drawer was a copy of the plat of the blueprint plat for this neighborhood. Oh, wow. wow. It wasn't the original, but it was an old, old copy that was probably, if I'm guessing, maybe like 1950, 1960, somewhere in there. And I, of course, pull it out and I frame it. You know, it's framed in my living room. And it's it's called the Waddle, we live on Waddle Street. It's called the Waddle Street Edition. And there is like the blueprint with like our house. Like I was like, what is, if that's not a sign, if that is not a sign, I don't know what it is. Oh, that is so neat. Wow. That's wild. Well, believe it or not, we are out of time. So you, I knew you would tell a good story. We we're going to have so much fun today. And we sure did. Before we end, would you please tell our listeners where they can find you to follow along with your projects, to learn more about you, that kind of thing? Yes, I would love it if they followed along with me at thistlewoodfarms.com. They can also find me on Instagram at thistlewood and of course, Facebook, TikTok, all the socials, wherever they consume social media. Wonderful. Well, Karianne, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Y'all are hilarious. I love this. <laughs> well, good. We do our best around here. <laughs> Thanks again, Karian. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to True Tales from Old Houses. And thank you to our guest, Karianne. If you love this episode, just let us know. Drop us an email. Leave us a voicemail. Or please consider leaving a rating or review wherever you enjoy your favorite podcasts. To continue the conversation, join us on Facebook and Instagram at True Tales from Old Houses. And you may follow us individually. I'm at Blake Hill House and, of course, at Daniel Cantor. And to learn more about everything we discussed in today's episode or request a transcript, visit truetalesfromoldhouses.com. See you on the mini. See you on the mini.